and welcome to the Nonfiction Authors Podcast. Today's session is with Jordan Rosenfeld, and we'll be talking about how to effectively use backstory and flashback scenes in creative nonfiction. I'm Carla King, your host, and I'm happy to have you with us today. Jordan Rosenfeld is the author of novels, Women in Red, and Forged in Grace, and six books on the craft of writing. Most recently, How to Write a Page Turner, the best-selling Make a Scene, Writing the Intimate Character, A Writer's Guide to Persistence, Writing Deep Scenes, and Write Free. Her freelance articles and essays have been published in hundreds of publications, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, Scientific American, Writer's Digest Magazine, The Washington Post, and many more. She's also a freelance manuscript editor, writing coach, and she teaches online classes too. Hi, Jordan. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Carla. It's great to be here. I just want to say you you teach, you write, you, know, you write articles, you you really walk the talk. When um, I've known you of you and seen you speak and looked at your books for a long time. But in preparation for this podcast, I just sort of Googled you and you really are in the Atlantic and Writer's Digest. And I mean, you're just everywhere. I don't know how you find the time. Is that the question? How do I find the time? How do you, that's the first question because we're all, you know, struggling with our books and a lot of nonfiction authors, especially are, have a whole business and they're writing about their business for the book and they want to promote and um, we're told to grow our platform by writing stories and articles and columns and all that. So I just didn't want to throw that out <laughs> right at you first <laughs> off. <laughs> well, let me first point out that I've been working at this for over 20 years. So, you know, when I started out doing anything, freelance writing, you know, I started out as a fiction writer. That's my love. That's my passion. And then I always had these jobs that I, well, I quote unquote hated. And the truth was there was nothing wrong with the job. It's that I didn't like working for someone else. So I was always looking for ways to work for myself. I'm just, I'm a lone wolf. I'm independent. And I was already like, well, I think I'm okay at this writing thing. So I would sort of look for opportunities that were writing related, you know, like I'd, I'd reach out to the local magazine. When I used to live in Petaluma, there was both, you know, the newspaper and the magazine. So I'd reach out to them and see if they took freelance. Yeah, I always just threw myself at things. Um, when it came time to write my first nonfiction craft book, ma uh, magazine, I was writing for Writer's Digest magazine and I just, I was editing very loosely. I'm going to answer your question, I swear. And um, I, I just sort of reached out to the editor of the, the books and because I thought I'd seen this, this craft element that wasn't yet written about, which was scene writing. And uh, I asked if they would take pitches from unagented writers and they said, yes. So I wrote a book proposal. So it was like, I was in my twenties. I had a lot of ambition and energy. That's, that's where I got my start, but it was, I always tried to keep my fingers in things writing related. And over the years, as I've gotten married, had a child, life gets more complicated and more expensive. <clears throat> it really comes down to, um, for me, always picking projects that I'm interested in. Because if you like what you do, you're going to make the time for it, even if it's a lot of different things. And I, so for me, everything I do feels connected. I teach writing. I freelance edit people's manuscripts. I write writing books and I write articles and essays. And so it's all, they're all big drops in the same bucket. How I make the time, you know, I'm a deadline driven writer or deadline driven person. So it's like, what's most pressing today? What do I have to do today? <clears throat> Excuse me you know, and so on and so forth. And over the years, you get really good at writing under pressure as well. And like being able to turn something out fast, you know, so it's, it's like, I, I wish I could give some magic formula. <laughs> I really do. But we for me, it's do. always been, I know, I think it really, the, the magic formula for me is picking things I like to do because then it never, even the worst work week is never bad compared to working for jobs I didn't like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Yes. And you wrote a lot of books on craft. I mean, six, is that right? Seven? How, why so six. many? Did you keep finding uh, <laughs> things that weren't being addressed? That's a good question. I mean, the first one I just was like, can I do this? Will they let me, you know? And, and it was, it was actually a lot of fun. I really enjoy analyzing the craft. Um, 
And then I took a big break. I didn't write a second one until A Writer's Guide to Persistence, which isn't per se a craft book. It's more of a like cheering writers on through the, the trials and tribulations of the writing path. And that came out of my own kind of dark night of the soul after my son was born and my agent didn't sell my novel. And I um, kind of felt like, who am I anymore? I'm just a mom. I don't write. You know, a lot of people go through that with children. And then um, once you've written a couple books for your publisher, pub <laughs> apparently my, I can write, but not speak. Once <laughs> you've written a, a few books for a publisher, um, there's kind of this momentum. I wanted to keep a momentum up, but it was definitely, I could only write a book if I saw a need. So um, I think most of that need came out of what I see as an editor. So I would be like, oh, or even teaching. I, I teach a course and people would be like, oh, I've never heard that before, or I don't hear that enough. Not like I'm, not like I'm recreating the wheel here. It's all stuff we've heard, but you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you hear it for the first time. And all of that would go into me thinking, you know what, I think maybe there's a whole book in this. Well, thanks. Yes. And you write uh, these craft books and you uh, edit and help authors in both fiction and nonfiction. And I always think that there's a lot to learn from fiction um, about nonfiction. And these days, not just, you know, okay, so creative nonfiction is memoir, mostly, right? Biography, autobiography, maybe you could name some more. But even inside these professional entrepreneurial or psych psychological or, you know, mechanical <laughs> books, um, authors tell stories, right? Mm -hmm. they and um, they tell stories to, in, to illustrate a problem and a solution or situation and they need the hardest thing I think that I've seen is the backstory and the flashbacks and putting enough information in without overwhelming or, or getting uh, tedious and boring and that's what I really yeah. want to dig deep yes. in uh, with you today so can you maybe just first talk about what's the difference between backstory and flashbacks and any other information you want sure. to you know sure. set the scene for us yeah, absolutely. I mean, backstory is kind of this general term for anything that you're sort of filling the reader in about your, we're going to say your narrator, right? In fiction, we call that a protagonist. In memoir and essay, that's the narrator who's you or some version of you. And so it's like, you want us to know that your narr narrator had a tough childhood and maybe was in the military and, um, you know, is afraid of snakes. These are all, this is all information. But if you just dump that on us in a big summary, and you don't engage us in scene. So scenes, right, which flashback scenes, we'll talk about this in a second. If you don't engage us, we get kind of bored or it gets, um, the reader can get bored, distracted, feel overwhelmed or waiting for something to happen. And, and it's funny that you mentioned, you know, how nonfiction can learn from fiction because this is where flashback scenes are a technique you could say that are borrowed from fiction. So what is a scene? A scene is this kind of unit of compelling action in which a, char a, a character or a narrator is pursuing a goal or learning something or discovering something, but there's, there's action or momentum, real time is passing. And you only get that when people are doing things or saying things. If we're just thinking, if we're just ruminating, we fall out of scene. So if I wanna let the reader know about my character having been in, a, had a traumatic experience in the military, I'm not just gonna say to the reader, well, there was that time in Korea when you know we almost died. And we'd be like, what, what, tell me more. So we drop into scene and we actually put our reader in the moment of that war uh, where you know you describe the scene, the setting, the actions, what, what people are saying, what they're doing as if almost as if we're watching a movie, right? So flashback scenes are really powerful at bringing the reader into the experience that the narrator wants us to feel and see so that we are engaged. If, if we don't have that engagement, we will likely get bored eventually. Great. Like so what I'm hearing from you is that flashback scenes um, work to illustrate and fill in the blanks of the backstory that needs to be told yes. so to it's, make, yes. the story make sense. Yes. And that's a good point because what I always say is that um, front story must trigger backstory. So you don't just randomly throw in a bunch of flashbacks. Like I just want to randomly tell you five things about my narrator and I'm going to do it in five random scenes. It has to be coming at a point in the story where you're like, I've, I've, I've told the reader this information. Now I need to illustrate it in scene. 
or else they're just going to have to take my word for it. Does that make sense? So it's like, um, I, I use an example in one of my classes that's actually from one of Michael J. Fox's memoirs, uh, you know, and he's been living with Parkinson since he was in his late thirties. And the story opens um, where he's describing the events leading up to this fall he has um, that ended up kind of really setting him back in his independence for a while. And so he sort of describes narratively summary what the scenes, you know, we were in Martha's Vineyard, this was happening. I was gonna go back to work on a movie shoot or I was staying behind to work on a movie shoot. And then he's like, and guess, you know what? Bad things happen. So then he goes into the flashback scene and he shows you, I'm standing up, I hear the phone rings, I walk into the kitchen. Before I know it, I fall, you know, I hit the ground or something. I'm very badly paraphrasing his wonderful book. So he, the one thing facilitated the other thing. He told us about it and then he showed us in flashback scene what happened. Front story is, and, and the other, there's also nuance we can talk about in a minute about you know, like why front story versus backstory, but I think you'll get there. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do want to get there. Um, and maybe we should talk about that now because my next question was going to be about, um, like more technical about verb tenses and all that, but maybe we should just go there now. Yeah. So, I mean, it, this is where I feel like a lot of memoir and essay writers in particular, I'm not, not so much um, just general nonfiction writers kind of run into problems and that's figuring out what is their front story. And I like think of the front story as what your reader came to find out about. And then your backstory fills in information we need to know. Now, for some people that's confusing because they're like, I'm writing about a time in my past. It doesn't matter when it takes place. You're, you just ask yourself, what is the leading story that my reader, so reader came here to know. I'm reading a book right now called Uncultured by um, Daniela Ma Ma Mastinek, I think it's pronounced. And she um, was raised in the Children of God cult. I don't know if you are familiar with that. It was a pretty serious cult. And then she, after she got out, she joined the military. So she's writing about, you know, two really intense parts of her life. And it, it all takes place in the past from who she is today. But the front story we're there to read about is her cult experience, right? So everything, she, she just kind of starts at the beginning of her cult experience and then works her way forward to the military. But sometimes in the military scenes, she will flash back to cult scenes. So the front story is she was raised in a cult and how she got out, similar to the book Educated. She was raised in a fundamentalist extremist family and she got out, right? We, we want that story, but then there might be stages in the story where we have to go back in time to illustrate something. And that's mm -hmm. our backstory scenes or our flashback scenes. So backstory is the supporting material, but it has to come in a way that is that is truly supportive and, and then engages us or else we will just go, <sighs> we'll feel like we're being lectured to yes. and drone out. In scenes, which is why scenes are so amazingly important. Um, and so how do you give, this is my question about verb tense, like, there are subtle ways to give the reader a clue as to where they are in the story. Are they in the now? Are they in the future? Are they in the past? And I always talk about verb tense. I don't know if you have any others or is it just flat out past, present tense? Oh, tenses that I recommend, you mean, or tricks? Well, yeah. I mean, how do you give the, the reader a clue? I, I know there's several devices, so transitions and then also verb tense as well. I think, I think you, well, there's a lot of little, there's a lot of little kinds of transitions. And actually that is something I teach in one of my classes. Of course, I don't have them up in front of me, but you know, things like um, the weather or the season, like you can reflect, you know, in the fall of my 16th year, and we know the narrator is 25, so we already know we're going back in time. Um, you can, if you're writing your story, your front story in the present tense, then if you go use the, using the past tense, we'll, we'll alert the reader. But it's actually very nuanced. And I, I feel like it's not as simple as just saying you change the verb tense, because sometimes that actually can confuse. <clears throat> and sometimes you're writing your book in the past verb tense already. So then you just need transitional language. or tra And so that's why I like using time, season change, um, or even just something as simple as, you know, um, it reminded me of that year 
I was in basic training. And then the next, then we start with the scene drops into basic training. <clears throat> so that it's really very interstitial, very small. You don't need lots of big language or alerts that you're going into the past, but you do need something or the reader will, will sort of lose themselves in time. Um, yeah, but it is a, that is a good point about verb tense. And I bet you that's where a lot of authors actually overwrite and as an editor, you slash and burn, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. There's a lot of like using had in the past tense, you know, he had gone and we had taken them. It's like, once you get to the flashback, you actually can be in whatever tense you're in. You don't need to, what is that? The past perfect or something. I'm terrible yes. with the names of grammar functions, but yeah, you can be, um, You. it's like, imagine, you just need a bridge to get you into the flashback and then you can stay in whatever tense. In fact, some people write flashbacks in the present tense, which is can work if you're doing it right. I like, noticed that in a recent you know. book, it was kind of shocking. I was like, wow, this, because I pay attention to it now. Yeah. Um, like, wow, that's pretty shocking. She just put me right into the past in the present tense because it's a more immediate experience for the reader. And so it's tempting to put, put yourself or your character um, in the action and have it be very, it, it has a whole yeah. another emotional impact, bigger yes. emotional impact, right? Yeah, I was, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and the thing about contemporary memoir, it's like, we have to remember if we're trying to be traditionally published, to publish a memoir today, you really have to write much more fictionally. It has to have a lot more scene and a lot more in the moment writing um, and a lot less, you know, kind of that ruminative. So in my classes, we talk about there being two voices in, in memoir and essay. One is the voice of innocence. I'll explain that in a minute. And one is the voice of experience. And the voice of innocence is the lived experience. It's the scenes. It's the putting us in the moment. And the voice of experience is the meaning maker. It's that voice that comes in and says, what I didn't know then was that blah, 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 blah. Now that I'm older, I blah, 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 blah. It analyzes, it summarizes, it makes meaning. But if you wrote too much of your book in that voice, like, and you're not showing us in the moment scenes, readers can get like slowed down and, and it can be harder to get published apparently. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I have noticed that about, um, well, I'm big in travel, you know, John Steinbeck and, you know, the big, the travel writers. Um, it is, they just do clip along today. And I almost miss um, mm -hmm. the richness of the description yes. that the old books have. So I are you too. saying publishing is, has been, you know, I think that, that? public, yes, publishing. So I miss it too. And I feel like memoir and essay used to be the place where you could ruminate and take these intellectual detours. And mm -hmm. for me, I'm more satisfied by the books where I feel the writer is giving me some meaning right but mm -hmm. you have to think of publishing as i mean the best comparison i ever got from an editor was it's like real estate we're looking for a product we can sell and we're competing with entertainment that is now instantaneous you can binge it in a weekend so fiction and memoir fiction and memoir the line has to be very blurred because they're afraid it won't hold people's attention unless it's someone famous right you yeah. know if Someone famous writes a memoir, we all rush out to buy it because we want the dirt or the juice. Um, but it's if you're not so famous, then you have to have to tell this gripping story. Like, you know what book I think changed the, like where the line changed was um, Jeanette Wall's The Glass Castle. I read oh, that memoir. Lovely, lovely book. It is yes. a lovely book, but I read that book and I was like, she's doing a lot of creative nonfiction here because I don't think anyone remembers that many conversations explicitly word for word. And I'm sure she was given direction. This needs to be more, you know, cinematic. This needs to be more fiction like, because from that point forward, I started seeing a lot more memoirs like that. And I think it's an incredible book and it made him, you know, I'm not judging her quality of writing. I'm just saying, I think she must have been given direction to really try to dredge up more to put into scene. I mean, I hear this at conferences more and more and it, and it does frustrate me because I think it's a, it's like a, the current zeitgeist, but it's going to change again in 10 or 20 years, you know, who knows what it'll look like. Yes. And I just recently uh, talked to an author on a podcast about owning the truth and whether you can, you know, change anything and when does it turn into a novel? 
But now on reflection on the glass castle, there was a lot of dialogue. And when she also, when she was small girl. So um, yeah, we could talk about that all day, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a whole, that's a whole podcast in and of itself. Yeah, it is. And I've talked about that in a couple of podcasts, actually. Um, but really what I want to focus on here that you're so good at is telling the story. I mean, where does, is there a, any, are there any general rules or guidance you can give us about <laughs> how much, I know this is going to sound silly, how much backstory how many flashbacks <laughs> um I don't know no, it's a good question more. I mean there probably are some roles that I, I don't know what I would say is focus on your front story beef up your front story make sure that it can stand alone that you could pull out all of the the backstory and it would you would still have a complete story it might be missing a few elements but you would have a mostly unless you're telling a, a more of that flashes back like every other chapter some people do a structure like one's in the present, one's in the past, that's a different kind of, it's almost like you're telling both stories side by side. And if your story is structured like that, that's different. But focus on your front story, figure out what it is and make sure you, you have that narrative arc for your narrator that is clear and, and goes, you know, starts with that beginning, middle and end. And then look for supportive places where, back, where flashback scenes are necessary to deepen our understanding of the front story. And that might only be five, that might be two, that might be 20, I don't know. Um, and also the, the problem is it also, there's also questions of chronology. Where are you starting your story? If you're starting like, you know, Daniela's book, Uncultured from the beginning of her, you know, her earliest memories in the cult, that's pretty great. It's pretty linear, it goes forward. But if you're one of those people who's starting, maybe you're starting way forward in time and then you're working your way back to that moment or you're flashing back and forth. Like there's a lot of questions that may come up for you if you're not just kind of following a linear structure, which a lot of memoir writers don't because what we've discussed in one of my writing classes is that a lot of what we're writing about as memoirists has some element of trauma to, associated to it or difficulty. And those things are often not linearly kept in our memories. So even writing about it can be difficult to do in a linear fashion. Sorry, I'm, I know I just, I said like 10 times more things than you asked. I'm wow. sorry, that's terrible. No, no, that was great. No, you're right. And these need to be addressed. And it's true. Um, there are the memoirs of overcoming a, a difficulty of abuse or something difficult. And I've seen it handled very well in books in a very f interesting ways, yeah. linearly, as you said, but also in fragments that, are not following a linear pattern they're just illustrating the incident and they might go to teenagehood or you know yeah. toddlerhood or it, it and it takes a lot of skill i think it does. and i think it takes a, a good editor <laughs> to to help with that in writers groups we can help a lot with the like oh that was you know a lot of us yeah. have written a lot and we know but there's nothing like an editor to really now help you navigate that timeline absolutely and and some people I will say don't write linearly I have a lot of students who don't write that way and so it's it's refreshing to them to know that they don't have to write an, a, a memoir that just starts in, at the beginning and flashes all the way to the end some people need to move in and out of time and some people do it well without like I, I couldn't do it because it's, it doesn't come organically to me but some people it does mm -hmm. I, you know, I've used, and with, with my writing group, we all started using Scrivener and I know there's sort of Scrivener like um, uh, apps out there now too, but I started marking um, present and then past like backstory, present, present, present in, in the app. And it was super helpful to oh, see yeah. how much was happening in my memoir about with that. Yeah. Um, and it also, the verb tense was important to me because I did choose present tense yes. and the flashbacks were in past um, and um, with f little transitions, maybe just white space. Um, how, what do you think about that? Can white space do yeah. the whole job? Um, mm -hmm. I think white space can be really powerful um, as, as a break to suggest that we're heading in a different direction because you can use white space to signal a scene change. So why not a, a flashback scene change? I think what matters is that there's some cueing information. So like when I'm reading Daniela's memoir, 
when I'm in the military section, any reference to the cult I know is past tense because it's already happened. So she, it doesn't even matter how she references it. I already know where I am in space and time. So as long as the reader understands like, oh, every time we talk about that time at my grandmother's house, they know that's in the past, then you could use white space to, to just, we're, we're moving there now. Or if, it, if you were recounting dreams or something ephemeral, you know, I think there's a lot of ways. I, I personally, the more I teach memoir, the more I feel it is, it is a form that lends itself to experimentation. And, and it is one of the most, and I know that some people would disagree with me. Well, maybe only traditional publishing would disagree with me, but I really have found the most impactful memoirs to be ones that don't just go limp. There's one, um, there's one by Lacey Johnson called The Other Side. I don't know if you've read that. That one is one that that is very nonlinear and and really worked for me. She she kind of pulls us in and out of the past experience, which is a traumatic one. Partly because you can't linger in it very long. It's so intense, which, you know, but she doesn't, we don't really know each chapter where you're going to end up, but you get somewhere by the end. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and you do write a lot of essays and, and sometimes in column form for uh, periodicals too. Um, you're right. I do think memoir is so much more essay-ish. What, what do you have to say with people of people writing prescriptive nonfiction, kind of inserting the mm -hmm. story? Like I, I was working with a, a psychologist who was writing stories about couples therapy yes. and, you know, so-and-so came in with this problem and, you know, yes. and then they journey through, but not, not, it's only an example. So they yeah. only, these people only come through a little bit at a time. Yeah. That yeah. seems kind of challenging at times. It is. It's funny because I'm editing something like that right now and have before. Um, and it's interesting because I actually gave a talk to a podcast symposium, Women in Podcasting. And and it's the same thing, like even in, in certain kinds of podcasts, you're telling stories, right? You're, you have to write these scripts to tell stories to, to engage the reader. I think what people need to understand is that, so for me, all good storytelling involves around scene writing. So you're bringing readers into a specific moment in time with action some kind of setting detail and maybe dialogue. And anytime you do that, you engage the reader. The question is in nonfiction, so the woman I'm editing now, I actually sometimes feel her scenes go on too long. And then I want to come back to that intellectual head that's giving me advice or telling me information because that's what I came for. So it's like, I actually think you have to be careful not to, to take it away too far from the, here's what I, the prescriptive part, here's what I came to tell you. So you want to use shorter little scenelets um, and again pick the highlight the ones that are really illustrating the point you're trying to make I would say I like that term scene scenelets <laughs> yeah scenelets I don't know why I call them that but you need to put a tm next to that <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Uh -huh. um well we just have a few minutes left do you have any other thoughts about how to attack um backstory flashbacks you know how Scenes. I mean, I, I think when you're at the brainstorming and even early drafting stage of your memoir or essay or how-to book, you want to really, um, again, ask yourself, even write down the events of the front story or of the main points you're trying to make. And then try, like, or if you're one of those people who has to do like a memory dump or you pour it all in, try to pull out what is actually going to be a flashback scene. You know, what is your front story? What is your backstory? pull out what can can be saved for later in essence and build that front story spine first. And then, you know, when you have the front story spine, then you'll know where you need to beef it up, where you need to illustrate points. Um, I think that's the, the best I can say. But I do think, I do also encourage people to not lose that voice of experience that comes in and makes meaning and analyzes. Maybe you weave it in a little more deftly. Um, a writer who does this really well she, she can write anything. Her name's Maggie O'Farrell and she's most well known for a book called Hamnet, but she wrote a book of essays. It's a memoir and essays about 17 brushes with death, her own or beloved's. And it's called I Am, I Am, I Am, which is from a Sylvia Plath poem. And she has such a good weaving of front story and backstory. She's such a good example. So I, I recommend that book um, for anyone who's interested. Also, Michael J. Fox. Sorry. Yes, 
for all those examples. No, I'm definitely going to go out and study those. And I just love the term, the spine, the front story spine mm -hmm. and the back story spine. We just had Ted Weinstein on talking about book proposals and business plans mm -hmm. and, you know, how to write those out um, chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you think that's um, a good exercise for mm -hmm. beginning? Or I just did that for a book I'm three quarters of the way through on, and I was surprised at what was happening in the book <laughs> when yep. I wrote it down. <laughs> oh yeah. I, d I mean, whether you want to go so far as calling it an outline or not, I think what I think is great about a book proposal is it forces you to write all those chapter outlines, chapter summaries, and a table of contents. That exercise alone, a table of contents and chapter summaries, which is like two, you know, small paragraphs about what goes into what happens in each chapter, will you know? And you could repeat that exercise a few times until you feel you're you've gotten what you want. That would be a great starting point for anyone writing. And actually, there's a great um, technique for essay writers in one of my favorite. <laughs> My, the best titled book ever by Adair Lara, which is Naked, Drunk, and Writing. And she has I love this, um, I love it too. And there's like a, she calls it her, like her story writing template or something. I forget. I think it's like in chapter three. And it just like gives you this model of like, you know, what, what I wanted, what my goal was, what got in the way, what I did instead. Like she breaks this down. And I have found that very useful too for either chapters or just standalone essays. So those would be my recommendations. Great. Thank you. Uh, we could talk for another half an hour for mm -hmm. sure. And, um, or just read all your books or take all your courses. You have a lot um, online. How can we reach you and find out about you? Um, my website is jordanrosenfeld.net. And that's Rosen, R-O-S-E-N-F-E-L-D. Get lots of variations on that. Dot net. And um, you'll find there's a classes tab. There's an editing tab. Uh, books and about me, but you can also contact me through that website or just feel free to give them my other email, which is jordanwritelife at gmail.com. And that's W-R-I-T-E. I know, shocked. Life, all one word at gmail because I check it more frequently. I do check the other one, but more like once a week. So great. That's it, Thanks so much, Jordan. Thanks for being our guest today. Thanks, Carla. You have a good one. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for joining us for the weekly nonfiction authors podcast. You can find out where to subscribe, listen, and watch at nonfictionauthorsassociation.com podcast. You'll also find a feedback link and we'd love your suggestions for topics and other guests you'd like to hear from. And don't forget to get on our mailing list for notifications about the podcast, as well as webinars and courses and many other events that help you write, publish, promote, and profit from your nonfiction books. Thanks again, and keep writing to share your experience and expertise.